everyone, good morning. How's it going? <clears throat> I don't know if you guys can hear me. All right, yeah. we can. Thank you all for joining me. I'm sure, some of you guys are on campus or doing a watch party, so. The numbers will be a little off. Last lecture will be our on our test for next week. Yeah, so this is the end of material for the second exam this week. So whatever we cover today uh, is going to be it for the next test. <clears throat> well, I tell you what, I started getting some very odd like spam comments on my videos, especially for your guys' class, I don't know why. It seems very strange. I like go through and report a bunch of spam and stuff. It's like herbal supplements and very strange. As always, let me now, if you have any questions, either put them up in the chat or on the sticky board, and I'll be happy to look at them there. We'll get started in just a few minutes here. And remember, this is a good time. If you have any questions about um, exam material or questions you might have about anything regarding that, like now's the time to post it. Um, so, otherwise, you know, you we'll have to email back and forth, but now's a good time to do it. Yeah, I'll talk about that when we get started here in just a minute. Thank you for bringing it up, though. Apologize for any screaming you hear in the background. It's my two-year-old waking up. We had a rough night last night, so. Um, can you guys let me know if anyone's like watching it in a group just for FYI on my part? I just want to make sure I'm not looking for like 30 people to log in and then like want you watching it in one room or something. His later days may already be on campus. All right, well, it's 10 o'clock now, so I'm going to start recording. Okay, so a couple questions. Um, again, this will be the last um, section of material for test two. So test two is going to encompass, um, I think I had it up. So. so test two is gonna cover, so all of the bugs and drugs sections, so antibiotics, dermatology, ENT, and then ophthalmology. So it's gonna be, um, all for test two, so whatever I cover today will be the end of it, which I should be able to pretty easily get through everything. We don't have too, too many slides here. And then um, I posted up the next prescription assignment. Um, I will be getting 
Okay. Problem, Rosina. Thank you for letting me know. Uh, I will be getting your feedback done today or tomorrow for the prescription assignment, and I gave you two weeks from today to do that. So that's plenty of time to get that knocked out, and you'll have your feedback, so that way you should be able to um, get all that taken care of and incorporate any of my comments in there to help out, you know, for scoring purposes for next time. So it'll be doing the 13th, uh, I think at like 11.59 or something. So if you see anything different on blackboard just let me know there uh there was one question on the sticky board here someone said uh this might be a dumb question incorrect there are no such things as dumb questions the only bad questions you have are the ones you don't ask right uh but anyway so can you explain on durham slide three uh part where it says increased concentration makes increased drug transfer yes so basically what you're going to see there is that i'm going to draw this out for you So if you recall, when we were talking about um, transfer of substances across a membrane, so imagine the square here is my membrane I'm trying to cross, and in the case of derm, that's the skin, right? And so we want stuff to go through here and then out the other side into, say for instance, you know, through the skin, into the uh, circulation, whatever the case may be. There's several things that will influence that, right? So one thing is like the lipophilicity of a drug, so the more lipophilic it is, the easier time it crosses but also the concentration gradient too. So that's when it says higher concentration. So if I go from something like a 1% um, solution to, or you know, ointment or something to like a 3%, you're gonna find that that's gonna increase the, the cro how much is gonna deflux across that membrane. Um, so the bigger the concentration over here, so big C concentration, the smaller the concentration on the inside, the more flux is gonna happen there. So that can be achieved by increasing the concentration. Um, recall also that the more surface area you cover can affect that as well. So more surface area means uh, more absorption. All of that uh, can influence it. But yeah, so increasing the concentration is one of the easier ways to do that. So and again, um, revel in my art and, and how great it is because it is certainly something to behold. Just kidding. It's pretty awful. But I did not go to school to become a, uh, a artist. I went to be a pharmacist and a teacher. So here I am. So anyway, uh, Marissa is asking, I had a question regarding the indications for the drugs. I know in week five, you emphasized not having to remember. I just want to make sure that's still consistent for the rest of the lectures here. For example, we don't need to know uh, which cover intra-abdominal infections. It's helpful to know the type of bacteria that are present in those. Yeah, I'm trying, I'm trying to give you some context in terms of um, how these drugs are going to be used, where you might see them used more commonly. However, though, for instance, with like ENT, like you need to know what kind of bugs are likely to cause otitis media, and that directly influences what kind of drugs we use to treat that, right? So for upper respiratory stuff, like the big three are strep pneumo, H. influenza, moroxalacateralis. Those are the most common ones. And so to know which drugs are going to help cover that, so for instance, like otitis media, like amoxicillin is a good first line, um, you know, using azithro as a backup, for instance, you know, things like that are what I want you to know for those individual sections. More broadly, during the, the bugs and drugs section, um, the big ones I want you to be familiar with are which ones cover MRSA, right? Which ones cover pseudomonas, which ones cover anaerobes, which ones cover um, atypicals, which ones cover things like C. diff. Like those are kind of the big kind of broad sort of topics that I want you to get out of that because things like pseudomonas and MRSA are so clinically relevant that when you, and they're so potentially, you know, dangerous to a patient who's got it, who's, you know, if you're not treating it effectively uh, with the right drugs, you can really cause some patient harm. That's why I want you to know this stuff early and start to internalize it. So that way when you're on rotations and you see someone's on Venko, you know that, they, okay, they're likely trying to cover for gram positives. Maybe MRSA is on that list. That's why we're using it. Those are the things I want you to start taking away from that. If you want further clarification, um, feel free to ask questions. I don't, I don't mind talking about that some more. Uh, we'll probably have some extra time today. So again, if you have questions for the test or thinking about them now and put, putting them up because um, this is going to be our last time before the next test. And so I want to make sure I get anything. Um, we can talk about anything there here while we have the opportunity to. Okay. Um, okay. So let's talk about ocular pharmacology. And this is the last section for test two. So um, a lot of the medications we're going to be talking about, and this is actually a good transition from dermatology into um, talking about um, ocular pharmacology because, again, we're using a lot of these medications topically. 
while there are some varieties of drugs that we can use, um, for instance, as like subconjunctival injections, or we could do intravitreal injections and things like that, that's really much more specialized. That's something you're going to see used in like an ophthalmology specifically. And, you know, to be honest, I don't see a lot of PAs work necessarily in ophthalmology specifically, but eye complaints are super, super common for like family practice, urgent care, ER, you're gonna run into this stuff all the time. And so I wanna show you some of the common things we'll be using to manage these conditions. Um, and most of them are gonna be topically administered. And so um, kind of a good segue from DERM. Also, you know, ENT, we're talking about the head. So you know, a lot of crossover uh, amongst this. So here's some different examples of ways um, that drugs can be administered uh, from an op uh, ophthalmologic sort of standpoint here. But topical, as I mentioned, is the most common one, mainly because it's convenient, uh, it's relatively cheap to do, and, and pretty safe for the most part. Honestly, the biggest safety risk we run into with using ophthalmic meds is going to be concerns for things like infection. Um, because the eyes are relatively um, unprotected site as compared to something like your skin, for instance, or your GI tract. Um, you do wanna make sure we're keeping things sterile. And so that's why we'll, we'll mention this more in depth when we talk about um, ways to use these medications and some of the tips for administering these drugs as well. Um, however, you know, it's not great from a compliance standpoint because a lot of people don't like to give themselves eye drops or it's, you know, it's a very sort of, uh, some people have sort of phobias associated with it and things like that. Um, so it can be a challenge, especially imagine giving a small child eye drops, I mean, it's tough enough sometimes even brushing their teeth or getting them to take other medications orally, it's a challenge, right? So we'll talk about some ways we can try to get around that. We can also see some risk though, and not just having, you know, things like conjunctival toxicity and corneal toxicity, but you also have to think about the sort of the way that drugs are eliminated from the eye, and that can lead to some systemic side effects, which I'll mention here in just a little bit. Um, so most drugs are going to be given either as um, usually solutions for the most part. Remember the difference between a solution and a suspension. Solutions are a nice homogeneous mixture. The drug itself is in, um, is dissolved evenly throughout that, um, that solution there. Whereas suspensions, drugs are typically um, not as homogeneous. They settle out. They tend to, um, you know, so we don't use that as common. Usually solutions are much more frequent when you think about eye drops. Um, but we can have different means of prolonging contact with the eye. And so the more contact time that a drug has with the eye, the more effect that it can have, um, the more staying power it has, the higher efficacy in some cases there. And so some ways that we can increase that time in the cul-de-sac of the eye um, is are gonna be using things that are more viscous. So if I can use like a gel or an ointment, that's gonna be able to stick around for longer, have bigger contact time, uh, and maybe more effective. But there may be some downsides to that too, like using an ointment um, tends to blur the vision, which is not great if someone needs to go and drive a car, for instance. Um, there are even some other means uh, of administering these drugs. So for instance, here's an example of an implant you can actually put within the eye itself. This would be an example of a drug um, to administer over a really long period of time. For instance, someone with like cytomegalovirus with like HIV or something like that. So. Let's talk about the kinetics and how those are a little bit different um, with uh, patients receiving ophthalmic meds. So in terms of absorption, a lot of that is gonna be dependent, and this is actually similar to what we see with, um, you know, drugs being applied topically from a dermatologic sense, right? So things like, you know, how uh, lipophilic it is, how easily it's able to cross concentrations and things like that can make a difference. And so ultimately the rate and the extent of the absorption is gonna be dependent on things like time in the cul-de-sac, um, things like the tear film can play a role here. Um, nasolacrimal drainage, I'm gonna highlight this because this is what can potentially lead to systemic side effects you may get from topically administered drugs in the eye, right? And that's not something you normally think about because you think, okay, the drug just works in the eye. But there can be cases where you can actually see systemic issues arise due to nasolacrimal drainage. Very highly vascular in that mucosa there, so it's relatively easy to absorb drugs. Um, and again, as I mentioned, that diffusion across the cornea and conjunctiva can play a role as well. And so you can affect this by actually doing things like changing the drug formulation. So for instance, going from a solution to an ointment may increase contact time and absorption. You may see that by blocking the tear ducts, either with like surgical cauterization, or you could even do like a silicone plug or something, that may prevent drugs from being eliminated through that nasolacrimal drainage and increased absorption, right? So a lot of ways that can happen here. 
Um, as I mentioned, the nasolacrimal drainage uh, is important for systemic side effects because it bypasses first pass, right? It doesn't have to go through the liver like things taken orally would. Uh, and so there'll, there'll be a few classes of drugs here we can see can cause some issues there. Now you can see some transcorneal absorption of medications. Um, this is necessary to some degree for having local effect, like right there in the eye, for instance, if you're having conjunctivitis or something. Um, and again, it's all governed by that concentration gradient for the most part, but that's that fixed law we talked about before in terms of how things are crossing over. You know, we can't really change the surface area because that's pretty fixed when you're talking about the eye. So usually things like lipophilicity of the drug and, and the concentration gradient is the biggest things that we can have an impact on as providers here, right? So anyway, so we can see how um, things can be absorbed through the nasolacrimal drainage here and they can be absorbed directly into the systemic circulation um, right, right there, right? You can also see potentially there's risk for things like um, having bitter taste associated with this because some of this drainage go down the back of the throat and you can potentially see um, some, some taste associated with this but not as common as you would see with like nasal drops or something. And again, here's a picture like I was showing you uh, just a few moments ago. This one's a little bit neater, obviously. Um, you know, with the eye, it's a relatively thin membrane, just uh, as opposed to like the skin, for instance. And the surface area is fixed. So the biggest things we can have an effect on is going to be that concentration gradient for the most part. Uh, in terms of distribution, once things get absorbed systemically, uh, they get you know, distributed just like they would if you had taken an orally or IV, for instance. However, some drugs can accumulate in the eye even. So here's an example of uh, chloroquine, which is sort of a uh, cousin to hydroxychloroquine, if anyone's being uh, keeping up with uh, you know, treatment for COVID and things like that. But this one can actually deposit what they call bullseye lesion in the eye itself, which is kind of interesting. Um, you know, it can lead to some ocular effects as well, depending on the situation. But uh, once things get absorbed, uh, they can then potentially be metabolized and then excreted. Um, if they're absorbed systemically, they just get eliminated like it would be otherwise, you know, through the liver and the kidneys. Um, however, though, some drugs get metab metabolized directly in the eye. So, for instance, here's a drug called latanoprost, which will become important when we talk about glaucoma. It can be turned into its active component, prostaglandin F2-alpha, in the eye itself. So, so first off, I want to talk about our ocular antimicrobials. Um, we'll talk about these. We've already covered the antibiotics in general, so I'm not going to uh, really belabor those points too much in terms of like things like mechanism because we have already covered that, but we will talk more specifically about how they're used ophthalmically uh, and how um, that may be different, how um, resistance patterns change, all, all those kind of things are what we'll mention here. But, you know, infectious disease of the eye is quite common. Uh, we can end up seeing a lot of periocular infections. Obviously, preceptal infections um, tend to be easier to treat. They are going to be um, usually more sort of, um, uh, you know, superficial easier to treat in terms of our topical antibiotics there, whereas more postseptal or orbital cellulitis that gets more involvement um, is going to be more difficult to treat and typically topical antibiotics won't be sufficient. And so in those cases there, we may require more um, systemic therapy, so either oral or parenteral therapy potentially, right? And a lot of times the route of the antibiotic will depend on other patient specifics as well. So not only um, just how much uh, involvement's going on here around the eye, but also things like the age of the patient, um, if they're immunocompromised, uh, or the, the clinical setting, right? If you have someone who had like a penetrating trauma uh, secondary to a car crash, right? That's more um, you know deep and involved. Perhaps you're going to require more systemic antibiotics than if it was a simple surface level sort of issue there, okay? But we're mainly going to focus not necessarily on systemic antibiotics, but the topical ones that we're going to be using most commonly in terms of um, treatment of like, you know, run-of-the-mill sort of eye infection stuff, right? And so in some cases, you can see the microbiologic spectrum can change over time. So for instance, like changes in, in haemophilus influenza, um, you know, as a result of in, uh, vaccination rates and things like that. But you're going to find typically a lot of the common um, upper respiratory tract stuff will be there. So strep pneumo and more exotic like cataralis and whatnot. Also, a lot of um, skin stuff. So like a lot of gram positives like, you know, staph uh, can potentially cause these infections here. It really just depends on... Um, you know, the sort of the pre preceding sort of situation for the patient there. But for the small, mild peripheral infections, these can be generally treated topically. So um, the benefit of doing this topically is that one, it limits the systemic bioavailability of the drugs. 
And so we're not giving something orally that can be distributed throughout the whole body. So this limits systemic side effects, which is beneficial. We get very high local concentrations, which is great because um, we can treat infections that would otherwise be resistant because we can get really high concentrations locally at the eye. You know, in order to get those type of concentrations systemically, you'd have to give so much of the drug that it would probably cause a lot of uh, side effects for your patient. So we can't do that so from a systemic standpoint. But topically, we can get really high concentrations, which are great. Um, however, though, it frequently needs uh, pretty off, pretty frequent dosing, right? So, you know, dosing it three times, four times, maybe even six times a day in some cases there, um, because the staying power of a lot of these antibiotics is not great because usually they're solutions that wash away relatively quickly, so that's why you gotta treat very frequently. Most of the time we're gonna be dealing with broad spectrum antibiotics, meaning they can treat a wide variety of things. And again, having high concentrations locally helps us to um, overcome a lot of resistance. It otherwise may be difficult to manage when you're dealing with systemic antibiotics, so that's a big benefit there. And for the most part, we don't do cultures on these patients unless um, some sort of unusual organism is expected, like a fungal infection or um, you know, a patient has previous immunocompromisation, something like that. Most of the time, you just treat with a topical antibiotic, and most of the time, it's going to work. So getting into that, talking about conjunctivitis, again, you can see this kind of mild hyperemia and purulent discharge. A lot of times this is caused by viruses, right? Or it could be other environmental issues like allergies and things like that. Um, you can even see in some cases like workplace um, uh, irritants, can, you know, chemicals and things like that being aerosolized and patients aren't using, you know, proper, um, uh, you know, eye protection, things like that, can sometimes lead to some problems there. Even like contact lenses have... Uh, the ability to irritate the eye. And so your job is trying to differentiate, is this more of an allergic conjunctivitis? Is it ba you know, uh, bacterial? What's what's going on here? Um, so we'll see how we kind of manage that. But looking at the common pathogens, as I mentioned, um, typically it's your upper respiratory stuff, you know, staph aureus, you know, things on the skin that can sort of infect the eye. Um, but also think about like fecal transplant. You know, so imagine like someone um, had uh, some gut stuff, maybe they didn't wash their hands after going to the restroom, and then they rub their eye, right? So that's why you can see kind of a wide range of bacteria here because the eye is a relatively unprotected site. So again, another good reason to just walk, make sure you wash your hands, you know. Anyway, our main goal though, eradicate the infection and make sure we prevent long-term complications, right? These are the common ones that we're going to run into. And again, we've already covered just about every single class of these drugs already. So in terms of like mechanism, that's exactly the same. Nothing changes there. Um, we'll talk about how specifically we're using them though and how that's gonna change here, okay? Now, do I care that you know the formulation? No, right? If you deal with this stuff commonly enough, you'll get used to what is most common, right? Don't worry too much about that. Um, indications for use, I'm also not gonna get heavy into. I'll talk about some very specific cases of where we're gonna use some of these drugs a little differently. And so that'll become important. But again, just to show you the kind of wide range of things that these drugs can be used for. All right, so again, I'm not gonna ask you specifically, um, you know, which one of these treats blepharitis versus blepharoconjunctivitis. I'm not gonna ask that, right? But I will talk about some specific scenarios that I do want you to kind of know about. So first up are gonna be your macrolides. Erythromycin ointment, super common, been around for forever. Everyone's probably gonna use this at some point in their career. Um, there are also azithromycin solutions available as well. This one's not gonna be used as commonly, mainly due to cost. And again, if erythromycin works, you know, why, why use something else? Um, it's more expensive for the most part. Now I've talked about how these work before. Remember they're protein synthesis inhibitors. So they're preventing the bacteria from producing new proteins. It prevents them from replicating. So eventually their uh, own host immune system can come along and help kill off the bacteria, right? Um, for the adverse effects, the majority are gonna cause eye irritation to hypersensitivity. Every drug has the capability of doing that. Again, most of these patients had irritated eyes to begin with, so it's hard to say if the drug is necessarily making it worse, making it better, hard to say. But again, this is gonna to apply to just about every drug we cover for ophthalmology. Because again, the eye is kind of a protected site, so it's one of those things where um, you know it can be more likely to be irritated, right? more so than like the ear or something like that. So, uh, in terms of, uh, of dosing, I just want to make a point here. I don't care that you know the dose specifically. I just want to illustrate some of the points in, in terms of how we're using these medications here. So for instance, with something like a gel or an ointment, notice here the dosing is in inches or centimeters if you prefer. 
Um, for instance, you'd say half an inch, two to six times per day, and you say, okay, depending on the infection. Again, when you're writing prescriptions, don't put two to six times per day. Like that's something that you're determining because you're the provider, right? Um, versus something like azithromycin is coming as a solution that's gonna be dosed in drops. You say like one drop or two drops, however frequently you want to, the patient to take it there, okay? I'll talk about how you kind of figure out that dosing here in just a little bit though, in terms of how to apply it. Now, um, a lot of times these uh, conjunctivitis cases coming in here, you don't really know if it's bacterial versus viral. Difficult to determine. All you know, you got this patient with a really inflamed eye and you wanna do something about it. So frequently erythromycin is used uh, because of its kind of soothing property. It's a nice ointment and it will help to kind of decrease um, some of the irritation the patient's feeling. Um, and even if you're not confirmed that it's a bacterial infection, and again, sometimes viral infections can precede bacterial ones, it's probably okay to use it. And again, resistance is not as big of an issue because you're getting really high concentrations here um, when applied topically like that. So erythromycin, relatively cheap, easy to use, used probably more often in viral cases and are perfect, but you know, it is what it is. Is it though, considerably more expensive, so we don't use it as frequently there, but can have its uses as something like erythromycin is not appropriate or a uh, patient has a very specific use case for it. <clears throat> Up next, we have a combination of trimethoprim and polymixin B. This is frequently called uh, polytrim here. And we've seen trimethoprim before, usually in combination with sulfamethoxazole, used, to man it, uh, used in Bactrim or Septra. Uh, depending on the um, uh, brand name you're dealing with there. And remember, trimethoprim is working to inhibit folic acid utilization in the bacteria, so preventing it from producing new DNA and eventually leading to cell death. Polymixin B, on the other hand, is going to be one that is um, useful for sort of punching a hole through the, the cell membrane for the bacteria and allowing the contents to lyse out of it and, and killing it off as well. So dual mechanisms here can work kind of synergistically with one another, one on... DNA synthesis, the other on the actual cell wall itself. Um, again, similar indications here, similar uh, adverse effects, so nothing really unique. I'll talk about some unique side effects just a little bit later on, but just another option you have available to you if maybe erythromycin was not available or, um, you know, um, patient's insurance covered this versus another drug, this, this can be a useful one there, okay? Uh, sulfacetamide can be used by itself. This is very similar to sulfamethoxazole. Kind of think about how they're working um, through the same mechanism. Again, they're working earlier in this process here of utilizing folic acid to produce new nucleotides and DNA for the bacteria. So um, one notable thing here though is that really watch out for history of like a sulfa allergy or sulfonamide allergy because there can be some cross reactivity here and that can cause even worse conjunctivitis and allergic symptoms in that patient. So obviously you don't want to trigger that off. Okay. And again, all these can be used pretty interchangeably for the most part so far here. Um, bacitracin, we talked about it being used topically, so pretty good from a topical first aid sort of ointment here. We can also use it in the eye. Uh, remember, things that are designed for ophthalmic use are specially designed to be put in the eye from a tonicity, a pH standpoint, all of that, so that way it doesn't cause undue irritation. So I would never be putting topical bacitracin into the eye because it would just really irritate the patient way more than probably whatever was bothering them in the first part or in the first place there, right? But anyway, <clears throat> bacitracin can be another option here, working on the cell wall to prevent new cell wall from being formed and causing the cell to eventually die. Now, fluoroquinolones, this is where we're going to be getting into a little bit more specialized use for um, these drugs here. So fluoroquinolones are not used as commonly as you'll see with stuff like polytrim or sulfacetamide, um, bacitracin, erythromycin even. Um, those are That's like run-of-the-mill kind of stuff. Fluoroquinolones should be sort of reserved for more specific use cases here. So this would not be something you want to prescribe unless you have a pretty good reason for it. And again, it's easy to tell if it's a fluoroquinolone because it ends with floxacin, so it's pretty easy to tell from that standpoint. And there's a few here we haven't mentioned before, things like gadifloxacin and ofloxacin, but all of these have their ophthalmic uh, options that are available there. <clears throat> Remember, they're working through inhibiting that to um, topoisomerase, the DNA gyrase to prevent the DNA from being unwound and rewound such that you can't be um, causing strand breaks, causing DNA damage to eventually lead to cell death, right? Now, here's an example um, where you can see that um, it can cause like a white precipitate. That's kind of a unique sort of side effect there with superfloxacin. You know, people might think they're having increased discharge related to the infection, but frequently this is just due to the, some of the drug precipitating out once the 
um, the vehicle sort of evaporates there. And you can have some unpleasant taste, and that has to do with that nasal lacrimal drainage um, with some post-nasal drip. So that's one thing you can notice with that, even though it's an ophthalmic med. Um, in terms of coverage here, this is where you're going to hold off and use these. If you have patients, for instance, have a history of like corneal ulcers, um, especially if they have like an eye infection and they have a history of using like contact lenses, um, because again, the risk for pseudomonas does go up there, and these drugs will have pretty good coverage against um, pseudomonas. <clears throat> and again, um, preferred in these cases here, the so corneal ulcers, history of contact lens use, fluoroquinones are pretty good to use. Um, however, the, that's the reason why we don't use it all the time is because of the expense of the drugs here, and also we do see some degree of emerging resistance. That is kind of the downside of that one. Okay, so again, good for use if you have a high risk of pseudomonas. Again, classically, you think about someone who's using contact lenses. Aminoglycosides could also be used in, in place of a fluoroquinolone here, so things like gentamicin and tobramycin. However, you can find that after being used for several days, they themselves can cause corneal ulcerations. So I'd probably use this as a backup if maybe a patient could not afford something like a fluoroquinolone and they had a high risk for pseudomonas. This could be used as an alternative, but you do want to limit its use um, to prevent risk for developing more corneal ulceration. Okay. So generally speaking, when dealing with antibiotics in the eye, you want to make sure you're documenting visual acuity both before and after because you want to look for changes make sure that things are not moving in the wrong direction. Um, if so, that's when you need to think about referring out to getting more specialized help from ophthalmology. Because uh, again, if you do not treat this appropriately and the patient loses vision, for instance, that's on you. And so if you did not do the proper care to check to see how vision is changing, you didn't refer out to the right people, then you're kind of liable for that. So again, vision is a very important sense that we have. We don't want to do anything to, to worsen that for our patients, right? Now, how do we, in general, kind of administer ophthalmic medications? Um, typically, the first thing you want to always tell patients is to wash their hands. This is always the most important thing because we don't want to give them a secondary infection with all the gross cooties that are growing there, right? So soap and water first, and then uh, make sure that they're avoiding touching the dropper or the, the doses for them to the eye itself. Um, don't touch the tip of it with their finger, things like that that could infect it. Um, also, and it sounds kind of common sense, but tell them not to be sharing this with other people um, because again, contamination can occur, can lead to further infection. So don't do that, okay? But anyway, so first off, and again, this is dealing with like drops and suspensions, uh, have them tilt the head back. They're gonna go ahead and pull the lower eyelid down to form a nice pocket there so you can see the cul-de-sac. And then holding the dropper with the other hand, close but not so close that you're touching the eye itself, then you can squeeze the dropper and place one drop into the pocket there. Most things will be doses like one drop for the most part in terms of um, ophthalmic application. Or like the ears or something, you may see like you know, get four drops or something like that. Um, but again, not as much volume can really be held there. Then you have them tilt the head forward and you want them to hold their finger over the nasal lacrimal duct. This helps to close that off and keep contact time with the eye for longer such that your drug is gonna be more effective. They can do that for about two to three minutes. Well, most patients probably won't sit there and actually do that for two to three minutes because uh, it'll probably seem like a, a terribly long period of time for them, but that's what we recommend. And then when they're done, they can wipe away the excess and then wash their hands again, okay? If they need to use multiple drops, you want to separate these out by a few minutes because you don't want to apply one drop and then give another one right after and then wash that first drug away. You don't really want to do that. Now, in general, Drops versus ointments. So ointments are better for kids who have poor compliance because they're probably going to be fighting you to get that into their eyes in the first place. And so um, even if you're fighting them and they're, you know, the drug, the ointment gets onto the eyelashes, it can still make decent contact with the eye. And so that can still allow for some efficacy of the drug. But also thinking about this is that ointments tend to blur the vision as well. For a little kid, probably not a big deal because it's unlikely they need to go I don't know, drive a forklift or something right afterwards or operate heavy machinery versus an adult, not necessarily the case. They may need to go to work or drive or something like that, okay? So that can be beneficial for kids um, for the most part. In terms of gels and ointments, the only difference with administering these is that one, um, you're not doing drops. It's actually gonna be squeezing like a ribbon of the medication. Usually the, that distance we talked about, like a half inch, three quarters of an inch, something. If they don't get it exactly right, no one's gonna actually Error for the most part, it's probably gonna work fine. You don't have to get like a little ruler out to make sure they got a half inch, as long as they're kind of guesstimating, it's probably fine. 
Um, and they also you know, have no need to cover the lacrimal duct because, uh, again, um, the drugs are much more viscous than the dosage form is, and so it doesn't wash away quite as easily. So patients with contact lenses and conjunctivitis should discontinue use of the contact lenses. They can go back to it and start using them again when the eye is no longer inflamed and they don't have any discharge for about 24 hours or so. Ideally, you'd like to be able to get rid of the lenses that could be possibly contaminated um, or they need to be adequately disinfected with some, I don't know, hydrogen peroxide or something like that, whatever um, solution they're using. Make sure they're really disinfected well, otherwise just say get rid of them. And unfortunately, they also say get rid of your eye makeup because it also could be contaminated However, if you have like the really nice stuff from like Sephora, maybe you don't want to do that. So you still recommend it to the patients. Whether or not they listen to you um, is, you know, always up for debate. Okay, so that was for the like a bacterial conjunctivitis. Let's move and shift gears a little bit and talk more about something like uh, allergy, like allergic conjunctivitis here. Talk about some medications that can help us out with that. You know, when your eyes are exposed to an allergen, whether it be pollen, whether it be animal dander, something like that, the, the reaction is roughly the same in terms of IgE antibodies being generated here. They cause uh, degranulation of mast cells and things like that, leading to stuff like histamine and leukotrienes, all kinds of things being formulated that leads to swelling and redness and itching. And this is very similar to what we saw with the antihistamines we talked about last time, right, with the ENT section. So first set of drugs here, each one antagonist, right? So we have ocular varieties of these that are gonna be working just like they do, uh, antihistamines work systemically. Again, the benefit with this is they're working very locally, they get high concentrations, um, and they limit the systemic side effects you might run into as a result of using like an antihistamine orally, for instance. And so overall, they're gonna help out with the redness, they're gonna decrease the swelling, and they will help decrease the itching associated with this, okay? So which ones uh, have this here? So, or which fall into this category? We have things like azelastine, we have alcaftadine, we have uh, bepotastine, we have imidastine, apinistine, ketotyphin, and olopatadine. So be able to recognize these being your ocular uh, antihistamines. Uh, Paige is asking, can you put a drop of the medication in the mascara to kill bacteria in it? That's a great question. I don't know. I don't, maybe we could run an experiment. Perhaps um, we could take... All of you and um, all of you, go ahead and get yourself an eye infection. Give yourself some pink eye, and then um, we'll have half of you. We'll put some antibiotics in your mascara, the other half not, and then we'll see who develops secondary infections. Perhaps probably not too ethical. I probably wouldn't do that to you guys um, or gals, as the case may be. Although anyone can wear mascara, right? Um, but yeah, it's a very interesting question. I don't know that anyone's ever tested that, but maybe you could be that that uh, trailblazer, and you can find out for us, right? Make sure you give me an acknowledgement in your thesis when you present that to, I don't know, JAMA or somewhere. Uh, anyway, so um, these drugs are going to be helpful, but they're working topically, working locally. Be able to recognize these as um, your antihistamines um, used ophthalmically. Um, notice here it says some MCS properties. That stands for mast cell stabilizing properties, meaning some of these drugs have also have the ability to prevent the mast cells from degranulating in the first place which helps to limit that allergic reaction from happening. Now, if someone's having active allergic conjunctivitis, those mast cells have mostly already degranulated. So this property is not so important as blocking the histamine that already is there leading to symptoms. However, these could use, uh, be used potentially prophylactically if the patient knew, for instance, that they're going to be exposed to animals or something like that. They can go ahead and pre-treat potentially and, and prevent those mast cells from degranulating in response to that, right? Keep in mind, these are going to be good for working um, when the patient's having active allergic conjunctivitis, or you could use it prophylactically, as I mentioned, prior to an insult, whatever their uh, trigger happens to be there. Um, note here that in terms of adverse effects, you know, ocular irritation, yeah, everything can cause that right in the eyes. Um, but the main thing here is just ocular dryness, which makes sense if you recall, we talked about the anticholinergic properties of our antihistamines prior. Last week, we talked about this, I think. Um, where it causes a lot of drying effect, where it dries the bones, part of that mnemonic for the anticholinergic properties. And so it makes sense it could cause macular dryness, could lead to some irritation from that standpoint. So kind of measuring the, the pros and cons there. It takes about two weeks of full therapy to really see full effects there. So let them know, hey, if it doesn't work within a few days, keep at it uh, and see how it works within the next two weeks. So 
There are pure mast cell stabilizers, and I only mention these here briefly because um, these may be useful if patients uh, are unable to tolerate an antihistamine, but there's, these are not going to be as useful because if a patient's having active disease or active uh, conjunctivitis, this doesn't do anything for them, right? This only prevents mast cells from destabilizing and releasing their contents. If they've already done that, then these drugs don't really have a whole lot to do, right? Um, so this is better for patients who have more kind of like consistent symptoms, you know, say throughout a season, and they can take this in order to prevent their symptoms from occurring in the first place. So, you know, someone was taking um, ketotiphen and they were having terrible ocular dryness um, for their seasonal allergies. They could use something like a mast cell stabilizer to prevent symptoms. These are not good for treating acute symptoms. So that's the big difference you're going to see there. Okay. Um, three in this category, including cromelin, lodoxamide, and metacromel. So as I mentioned um, before, not useful for acute symptoms, so they'd have to be taking this consistently for about two to, a week to two weeks to really see full efficacy there. And they oftentimes require pretty frequent dosing, so not great from that standpoint. Again, useful as a backup perhaps, but for the most part, stick with your antihistamine. In some cases, you can use a combination of either a vasoconstrictor by itself, or we can use the combo of a vasoconstrictor plus an antihistamine. And so if you recall from our talk of ENT drugs, the vasoconstrictor oxymetazoline, these drugs do the same thing, and they're going to have very similar side effects as something like oxymetazoline. And so the vasoconstrictor component here are going to be working on the alpha adrenergic receptors to cause vasoconstriction, right? Why are the eyes all red and inflamed looking? Because those vessels are dilated, leading to swelling and redness and all that. So you can use a, a, a vasoconstrictor to help mitigate that effect, right? So things like tetrahydrazoline, nefazoline, or the combination of phenyramine, which is an antihistamine, plus nefazoline. You'll sometimes see that uh, in combination together. So they kind of get a dual benefit of causing vasoconstriction and blocking histamine. Now, if you recall, when we talked about afrin or oxymetazoline in the nose, you did not want to use this for more than three to five days because of the rebound nasal congestion. Same thing can happen here with the eyes. And so we do not want them to use this for more than two weeks or so because they can have rebound hyperemia, rebound uh, swelling and redness. Um, so we don't want them to take this for too long. So make sure they're aware that they are taking it for a long period of time too. They need to wean up. We need to come up with some way to wean them off of that. Um, so another good counseling point for those patients there. Typically, and remember with eye stuff that, you know, a lot of these drugs may be over the counter and you can self-treat, right? And you can um, kind of manage this, the patients can manage this themselves, but they need to know if it's not improving over the course of like three days or so, they really need to follow up with a provider to get further evaluation because there could be something going on. There could be an infection that they're just treating the symptoms of. But that infection just sitting there smoldering and they're not doing anything about it. And again, because the eyes are so important for our senses, we want to make sure we don't do anything to that. We want to make sure we, we can um, not have any permanent negative effects on the eyes. So have them follow up. All right. So what if our antihistamines or our vasoconstrictors were not enough? We could find some other means of helping to reduce inflammation. So this is where our non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. We've talked about ibuprofen and naproxen before. Here is where we can use uh, ophthalmic NSAIDs to help out with blocking cyclooxygenase from producing a lot of inflammatory cytokines, help de decreasing inflammation. This is going to be useful for, um, especially like in post-surgical settings, or if you have patients who could not tolerate, um, if they're having inflammation, they could not tolerate any of the other meds we've already talked about, this is where your NSAIDs are going to be coming into play. These are typically not things you're going to be prescribing super commonly unless you are um, working in ophthalmo ophthalmology specifically or maybe see some patients who ophthalmology has recommended this. You may see them on it, so it's good to be familiar with it. Um, so, for instance, we have a few here, Bromfenac, Diclofenac, Flurbiprofen, Ketorolac, or Nepafenac. Some of these have um, systemic counterparts. So, for instance, you'll see things like Diclofenac, and Ketorolac here, they're using, some people say Ketorolac, I don't really care which way you pronounce it. Um, this is typically known as Toradol. So if you ever worked in an ER or somewhere else in the hospital, you've probably seen a lot of Toradol being used. So some of these have their ophthalmic counterparts, and this is what we're referring to here. Um, again, usually for post-operative inflammation and allergic conjunctivitis, it's really not being treated with other agents, right? So if you're into histamines and vasoconstrictors are not working for the allergic conjunctivitis, this can be a decent backup, but I would not use this often. Um, 
Odalise, I'm hopefully I'm saying that correct. Let me know if I'm not. Um, or Odalis, I'm not sure. But uh, you mentioned we can use NSAIDs post surgery, but doesn't it increase the bleeding risk? That's a great question. Um, yeah, so NSAIDs can increase a risk for bleeding because again they have antiplatelet effects. Um, basically, what you can see there is that um, could there be a risk? It, it'd be pretty small, especially if you used ophthalmically. Um, however, though, in a lot of cases, I'll still see patients who will be post-surgical and then can still receive NSAIDs. Um, it depends on uh, the patient's kind of baseline bleeding risk, if they're on other anticoagulant drugs, if um, how invasive the procedure they got was, things like that. So, you know, it's not uncommon, you know, patients have tubes placed, for instance, in their ears. Um, they can go on NSAIDs right after. The bleeding risk is not huge there. Um, versus if they have a really invasive like spinal fusion procedure that lasted 12 hours. Um, that may be another question altogether. So um, it's very patient and situation specific, but um, theoretically, yes, there's an increased bleeding risk. Um, however, with the ophthalmic varieties, you're not gonna run into that as often. More often than not, um, you're gonna see issues with in, you know, irritation like keratitis, and whatnot, the risk for this goes up, which is why we typically avoid using this unless they're kind of refractory to all other options or unless the ophthalmologist is specifically recommending it. Um, you can even see things like intraocular pressure increases, which we'll talk about more when we get into um, discussing glaucoma here in just a little bit. It's O Dallas. Okay, very good. Thank you. Um, I figure it's one of those two, but um, very good. Anyway, so. Let's say even our NSAIDs are not really working at this point here. What could we do instead? Well, um, glucocorticoids can also be used, right? And again, using glucocorticoids uh, ophthalmically is nice because it helps to mitigate some of those systemic side effects, which we kind of mentioned um, previously when we we're talking about ENT stuff. And again, glucocorticoids are going to come up. Um, they're recurrent players in, in a lot of conditions we'll, we'll talk about as days go on. Um, Anyway, so again, these are helpful for suppressing the allergic response. These are very powerful at what they do, um, but recall they do take some time because, again, they're working at the site of the nucleus to actually change transcription of inflammatory factors and things like that. So slow acting, but very powerful. Um, and you can also end up seeing some impaired wound healing as a result of that, which may be beneficial if it can help out with like decreasing scar formation. But again, this is a much more specialized use of these drugs. Ophthalmology is frequently going to be the ones who are recommending this or prescribing it. Um, so uh, again, very special use cases. You as someone working like an urgent care or family practice, probably not, probably wouldn't be using these, but patients may come in on them. So it's good to be aware of what these drugs are when you see them. So what um, can we use these for? You know, severe ocular allergy, um, inflammation following surgery. These are kind of the common things you're gonna run into for that, but very um, um, use case dependent. That's why, again, we usually leave it to the specialist to recommend that. Um, either given topically, you can find some topical drops and things, or actually you can see some injections done intraocularly, which we do a lot. Um, we have some ophthalmologists that do some surgeries at Nemours, and we'll see this uh, pretty commonly. So the problems though with the ocular glucocorticoids is their symptoms uh, or side effects tend to be worse than even what you see with the NSAIDs. So for instance, things like cataract formation can happen here, um, elevated intraocular pressure, which is not great for someone who already has glaucoma, uh, infections, because again, they do suppress the immune system to some degree, and they can lead to delayed wound healing and ulcers. So typically, again, just like we would see with systemic corticosteroids, you want to limit how often they're being used, or at least how long they're being used for, okay? So um, that's a, really the big thing you want to, to notice there. So typically limited time use for these drugs. Now here's some of these you'll notice um, as being ones we've seen used systemically before. So for instance, like dexamethasone and prednisolone have their oral counterparts, but here we're using them topically. Um, diflupredinate, fluoromethylone, lodopredinol, and then remilexone and triamcinolone. Notice these three here, I put asterisks on them because these are a little bit different. These are what they call soft steroids, meaning they have lower risk for causing intraocular pressure increases. So this would be better, these three would be better for someone who has a history of like glaucoma, for instance. These would not increase the pressures quite as much. Okay, so moving on, um, let's say we have someone who just has dry eye. I don't know if I'm dating myself, but if anyone's familiar with Ben Stein and his old Visine commercials they used to use for... Uh, you know, for dry eyes and whatnot. But um, there's a lot of reasons why patients may have dry eyes, whether it be due to chemical burns, it could just be due to um, medications, right? Drawing medications like antihistamines could do this. Um, autoimmune conditions can do this frequently as well, right? Or with derm, we talked about um, 
drugs interfering with vitamin A, like isotretinoin can actually cause dry eye and whatnot. So a lot of conditions for this. Um, ideally though, you wanna go ahead and treat the disease first. So if it's like an autoimmune condition, we'll get the inflammation under control and that should fix the dry eye problem there. Uh, however, though, there could be some physical things we could do, um, which is outside of my scope, but at least worth mentioning here. So for instance, if you could do like a silicone punctal plug, or if you can actually do cauterization of the nasolacrimal duct, that will keep whatever tears the patient is producing around for longer. So that's one thing. However, um, in terms of medications that we can use to treat this, um, typically they're going to either be like hypo or isotonic solutions that contain things like surfactants and thickeners. So they'll be actually like kind of thicker than normal tears will be. And they'll stick around for longer, helping to sort of keep the eye hydrated and prevent irritation and corneal abrasions and things like that. So we have things like a balanced salt solution, which is just BSS. You'll sometimes hear that being referred to that, uh, as that. Um, carboxymethyl cellulose, hydroxypropyl cellulose, and then polyvinyl alcohol. So if you hear like artificial tears, things like that, these are kind of the agents we would see being used for dry eye. If that was not effective, there is another drug we could potentially use. Here's one called cyclosporin, otherwise known as restasis when used in the eye. This is actually um, useful for patients who are having like an autoimmune condition leading to their dry eye. Um, and in fact, you'll see cyclosporin more often than not used for uh, transplant medicine or used in transplant medicine to prevent patients from rejecting a transplanted organ, for instance. And it does that by preventing the immune system from functioning. It's an immunosuppressant. So it can prevent your uh, organs from being rejected. It can also um, uh, work to prevent your autoimmune condition from causing severe dry eye. So this is useful kind of as like a third, fourth line perhaps. Um, it will help to decrease things like interleukin-2 release and T-cell activation, um, but it uh, really causes a lot of irritation. That's why we don't like to use it as much because uh, it can cause ocular burning, uh, blurred vision, foreign body sensations, a lot of very frequent side effects are seen with this, but very helpful. If the patient has an autoimmune condition, that's one of the ways that it's manifesting. All right, now switching gears and getting into glaucoma. What is glaucoma? Basically, it's this condition characterized by elevated intraocular pressure, right? And so that pressure over time tends to put uh, pressure on the optic nerve, which can lead to cell death, and eventually can lead to visual field loss and, and blindness, right? There's two main varieties here. There's open versus closed angle glaucoma. We're going to find that the medication side of things is going to focus on the open angle. Closed angle is much more of an acute condition, typically requiring surgical management. Open angle is a more chronic condition that medications will be the mainstay of therapy for. From a um, target standpoint, how we're going to manage this is by either decreasing aqueous humor production in the eye. Again, is, there's no laughing matter, right? Because again, the the vision is at stake here. Uh, or we could try to increase outflow of aqueous humor through the trabecular meshwork, okay? So you see kind of the normal pressures you can normally see in the eye itself. And then as you get elevated above that, when you have the ocular hypertension, this is where that pressure on the nerve can eventually lead to visual field loss there. As I mentioned with closed angle glaucoma or angle closure glaucoma, this is usually like an actual physical impingement or physical blockage of the drainage and that can lead to some really intense acute pain um, and again it's a very acute kind of condition sometimes surgical in nature versus open angle glaucoma is sort of a slow insidious sort of thing where the patients really won't even know they have increased pressure there unless they actually have it checked out and you can see how this looks like we're either uh, on the open angle side we're either producing too much or we don't have enough of it leaving right versus the closed angle where everything is sort of closed off, blocked, and that acute increase in pressure can be quite, quite painful. So our goals in therapy for these patients here, as I mentioned, is either, is to some way, decrease the pressure, either by increasing outflow or decreasing production. You can kind of normally see how the ciliary body is normally producing the aqueous humor that can then leave throughout this trabecular meshwork. And so we're gonna try to enhance that um, via a couple different ways. So um, the medications can kind of either do one or both of these sort of steps here. Um, the drugs able to increase outflow will include our prostaglandins, typically first line agents for a lot of people, our alpha adrenergic agonist, and then the cholinergic agonist. And then things used to decrease aqueous humor production is gonna include our alpha adrenergic agonist, and kind of notice these do both, right? Uh, beta blockers, which are gonna be our second line agents, and then carbonic and hydrase inhibitors. 
Frequently, you're gonna find patients need multiple drugs in order to control the pressure. Uh, this is why combination products are fairly uh, frequently seen. So prostaglandins, this is the first one we're gonna talk about. Um, what these are gonna do is they're actually gonna to bind to prostaglandin receptors in the eye, and they will increase the outflow. We don't know the full mechanism, probably has something to do with the serial muscle contraction or some kind of change in the trabecular meshwork cells to allow for that fluid to leave the eye more effectively. And you can always tell a prostaglandin because it's going to end in prost. So latanoprost, travoprost, bimatoprost, and tafloprost are all going to be your common ophthalmic uh, prostaglandins there. These work very well to get the pressure down. Um, limited side effects as we're going to see here. Um, some might actually be beneficial for some of your patients, you'll see. Um, and so because they're effective and have relatively limited systemic side effects, these are typically considered first line in most patients. There are some downsides we're going to see here. And the main thing being, I can see some hyperemia, some irritation to be expected. Uh, the unique thing with these though is, is change in eyelash length and iris color, right? So pretty unique sort of side effect here. Here's an example. Um, typically it causes a darkening of the iris. So if, for instance here, this person had green eyes before, and then they were treated with the prostaglandin in one eye, and notice the darkening, uh, the discoloration you see here, right? Patients already have brown eyes, or people who don't really care what color their eyes are, this is fine, but totally appropriate there. If they have eye color they do not want to change, then this may not be the best set of drugs to start out with. So really patient dependent on what they care about. Um, also note here, we actually can see the prostaglandins used uh, for aesthetic purposes. You can actually see here how it's being used to help produce eyelash length elongation um, for, you know, make the person look nicer, I suppose. I don't know that necessarily, um, I think one looks better, but some people have an opinion on that and they may think it looks way better. And so they'll use this from an aesthetic standpoint, right? Um, keep in mind, don't exceed the one-time daily dosing, which again, helps with compliance. But if you go more than that, I can actually, can actually cause a paradoxical increase in intraocular pressure. So again, don't want to do too frequent a dosing with that. Okay, so next up we have our beta blocking agents here. And so we probably mentioned these to a limited degree so far. We'll get into these a lot more in the cardiology section coming up. But basically what they're gonna do is they're gonna block beta receptors in the eye, which are normally responding to things like epinephrine and norepi and things like that. But less catecholamine activation, means decreased cyclic AMP production, which remember is a second messenger system, uh, which leads to less aqueous humor production. So blocking the beta receptors leads to less catecholamine activation, less aqueous humor production. And so you can imagine a state where you can actually use a prostaglandin plus a beta blocker and they work synergistically, right? You wanna use things that have um, uh, different mechanisms to get better synergy with one another. I would never use two prostaglandins. That wouldn't make sense, right? So in this case here, um, we can find that we'll have what we call non-selective versus selective beta blockers. Non-selective beta blockers will affect both beta one and beta two receptors equally. Beta one selective tends to affect beta one receptors more specifically, okay? Why does that matter? We'll talk about that in a moment, but in general, the non-selective ones tend to be more efficacious. However, there's gonna be some side effects or some downsides to using these, as we'll see here in just a little bit, okay? What are the side effects you can imagine though? Well, if you have a beta blocker that gets absorbed systemically, say for instance, through the nasolacrimal drainage, um, it would be the same side effects you would see from any beta blocker taken orally, for instance. Like we'll talk about the cardio section in the coming weeks. Basically though, blocking beta one receptors in the heart is going to cause it to slow down. Heart rate's gonna go down, uh, contractility is gonna go down. So this could be bad in patients with heart failure, bradycardia, heart block, not great. And then in some cases, you can actually see increased airway resistance. So beta-1 receptors are really important in the heart. Beta-2 receptors are important in the lungs. Beta-2 receptor activation there causes bronchial smooth muscle relaxation. It opens up the airways. If I block that for some people, there could be a risk of those airways starting to close back down and could lead to asthma exacerbations, for instance. Okay, But that is a reason why we might use a beta-1 selective agent in someone with a history of asthma because it would not affect beta-2 receptors in the lungs. Versus non-selective ones, while more effective, would not be good for someone with asthma, COPD, reactive airway disease, because we want those beta-2 receptors to be open to interact with either medications or natural catecholamines like epi and, and norepinephrine, right? So this basically kind of reiterates what I was just talking about there. Um, so non-selective beta blockers will affect both 
So again, you can always tell a beta blocker too by the O L O L here. So metaxalol is one beta one selective here, and then non-selective cardiolol, tenolol, and le uh, levobenolol. <clears throat> So uh, as I mentioned, selective beta blockers are only gonna block beta one, less chance for causing bronchoconstriction. Not zero chance, just less chance, right? Selectivity is all relative. No drug is 1000% selective for just one thing. Typically you can see some, some uh, cross reactivity there. Okay, uh, so up next, and then we have our alpha adrenergic agonists. We have two in this category called apiclonidine and then bromonidine. These can kind of work uh, through a dual mechanism. They can actually work presynaptically by decreasing catecholamine release, thus decreasing aqueous humor production, and to some degree increasing outflow. And then postsynaptically, whoops, uh, it works more so to in, uh, decrease aqueous humor production. So at a baseline, just know that by activating alpha-2 receptors, you're going to decrease production and increase outflow. Basically the takeaway take there. Um, here you're gonna find though, and we'll run into drugs like this when we talk about hypertension later on, uh, but these can work centrally as well. You can actually find um, that some of them can have some blood brain barrier penetration and lead to some of the systemic side effects we'll see here in a moment. But for most patients, pretty well tolerated, but you can see some irritation, pruritus, conjunctivitis associated with that. Um, we don't use this in, in small children because they tend to have um, the blood brain barrier is easier to penetrate in those young kids. It can actually lead to CNS depression and apnea. So you do want to be cautious with that because basically shutting down the central, um, the sympathetic nervous system um, in the brain itself you know, to some degree. But for most adult patients, the ionization state of it, just like what we saw with like um, second generation antihistamines, leads to less penetration. So for adult patients, you probably wouldn't see this, but for little kids, yeah, you can definitely see CNS depression uh, as a, a side effect. Uh, next, we have our carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. Carbonic anhydrase, we'll talk more about this when we get into diuretics uh, in, the, in the cardiovascular section coming up. But basically, um, carbonic anhydrase is an enzyme that converts CO2 and water into bicarb, and then can take bicarbonate and convert it back over to CO2 and water. And it's really important for helping with flow of water across various membranes. Bicarb itself doesn't have an easy time crossing, but when it gets converted into CO2 and water, it has an easier time. So basically by blocking this enzyme here, by inhibiting carbonic anhydrase, it prevents water flow from uh, occurring and prevents aqueous humor production from happening here, okay? So ultimately that's what we're seeing is it inhibits carbonic anhydrase in the ciliary body, decreases production of bicarbonate ions, and decreases fluid transport and intraocular pressure, okay? Based on all you need to know. It gets more complicated in the intracellular processes, but we're not gonna worry about that. Uh, two drugs in this category, including dorazolamide and brinzolamide. These ones, again, you're going to see typically used as like an add-on, not used as monotherapy for the most part, but um, mainly because they have a lot of side effects like burning and stinging, and they're not going to be as effective as something like a beta blocker or prostaglandin. Uh, the last line agents we're going to see here include our cholinergic agonists. These are used infrequently uh, because basically they cause meiosis to occur, right? They cause the circular muscles there um, to constrict on the, on the iris itself, and that allows for outflow to occur, okay? Basically, um, it causes a ciliar muscle contraction to facilitate more outflow of the aqueous humor. Uh, a few drugs in this category, including acetylcholine. This is more often used in surgical settings, just like the acetylcholine we produce. Uh, carbacol and then pilocarpine. The reason why we don't use these very frequently is because imagine if your pupils were fixed and small like that, not letting a whole lot of light in, can't really accommodate your lenses very well, so it leads to a lot of blurred vision, visual disturbances. So because of that, um, most people who still have good vision are not going to be tolerant of this because of all the side effects. They can't see well, they may not be able to read as well, things like that. So younger patients is not great, but if you had an older patient who had been, you know, having glaucomatous changes for years and now they're legally blind, they're probably not going to care, right? So again, very patient dependent and kind of what their preferences are, what the priorities are, things like that. So not great for younger patients. So as I mentioned, there's combo products too you'll frequently see. And for most patients, you're going to start them off on either prostaglandin or beta blocker. But keep in mind the patient conditions that may lead you to choosing one over the other. They have pretty blue eyes and they want to keep them that way. Maybe prostaglandins aren't great first line. They have asthma. Maybe using a cardioselective beta blocker or prostaglandin is going to be more, uh, more appropriate. So when you're reading these cases here on the test, make sure you're keeping in mind the comorbid conditions. Keep in mind the patient um, uh, 
bits of information in their past medical history, it could lead to choosing one versus the other. The combination products are frequently going to try to um, uh, leverage using multiple mechanisms to get um, synergy here. So for instance, using something like bromonidine plus timolol, alpha-2 agonist plus a beta blocker, or using uh, brinzolamide, a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor plus an alpha-2 agonist. So again, using different mechanisms to get better synergy. Um, also by using a combo product, it helpful, it's helpful for compliance because it's fewer drops to administer overall for the patients, which is nice. So who do we treat for glaucoma? Basically, um, if they don't have any big risk factors like family history and things like that, um, you go ahead and just monitor frequently, you know, monitor regularly uh, to look for any kind of glaucoma changes, um, you know, doing a good fundoscopic exams, looking for changes there. Uh, those with risk factors like family history, you go ahead and just start treating them, okay? Generally, start with a prostaglandin or a beta blocker, again, depending on the patient's preferences and things like that. And then uh, if you want, if you're worried about side effects, you could even try it in one eye first, see how they respond to it, and then you can bump it to use both eyes, okay? And then generally, we're shooting for like a 20 to 30% reduction in endocular pressure, generally. Okay, um, so kind of a, a last smattering of drugs you're going to run into. You'll see this a lot if you work like urgent care or um, in the ER, if you have patients who are coming complaining of foreign bodies or um, eye pain, something like this, frequently you're gonna need to do ocular exams. And so this is where this can be very useful here. So first off are ocular anesthetics. These are gonna be drugs here that block signal propagation. So if you're having pain in the eye and that signal is being propagated up the nerve and into the brain where it processes it. If you can inhibit those neurons from sending the action potential, by blocking sodium influx, then that causes anesthesia to happen. Just like if you always use lidocaine on the skin, for instance, um, the same sort of anesthesia happens there is, is the same thing we're doing to the eye. We have two uh, drugs in this category. We have tetracaine and preparacaine. Usually if you see a cane at the end of a drug, it's going to be a local anesthetic, right? So that's a pretty easy way to tell. Um, and we do this for a lot of things, so either like surgery, for foreign body removal, anything where you don't want the patient to feel what's going on in the eye. So one thing to note though, and again, don't ever write prescriptions for these. Don't let patients go out with a bottle of this in their hands because the problem with it is, is they don't have a blink reflex for like 20, you know, 10 to 20 minutes after they use it, which may make the patient feel better because now their eye doesn't hurt anymore because they don't feel it. Um, however, it's not great because they're not blinking as much. Maybe it gets dried out. Maybe they get further corneal abrasions. So don't do that. So just use these for these limited procedures. Don't let them go home with it, even though it made them feel so much better. And you're like, okay, well, just don't tell pharmacy I gave this bottle. Just don't do it because the risks are going to be much worse for them uh, by using it and kind of self-treating. So to go along with that for these diagnostic exams, for instance, if you want to do like a fundoscopic exam, um, by using a cycloplegic agent, you're able to basically um, uh, prevent pupillary uh, constriction and you open up iris, right? So basically you have a much better view inside of the eye uh, when doing your exams. And so these drugs, um, we're going to have two main mechanisms. We can either block muscarinic receptors to cause that mydriasis to occur, or we can use um, drugs that mimic the sympathetic nervous system, which I'll show you in the next slide. First off, I want to talk about the muscarinic antagonists. And again, they're leading to mydriasis. This is why you get so much blurry vision after you get your eyes dilated at the ophthalmologist, for instance, or the optometrist. So um, drugs like atropine, cyclopentylate, and then tropicamide. Right, those are all going to cause mydriasis, give you a better view inside of the eye itself. Um, biggest thing here is the blurred vision, right? And this can last a while. It could be a couple hours the patients will experience this, which is why sometimes you have to have someone drive you home after your optometrist visit or something like that. Um, on the other hand, we can act as an adrenergic receptor agonist or kind of mimic the sympathetic nervous system by mimicking drugs that act like norepinephrine, for instance. And these are usually less um, likely to cause prolonged blurred vision. Your eye is able to better um, accommodate with the presence of these drugs than they can with an anticholinergic, as it turns out. So, um, and sometimes you'll see these used together. Like I'll see phenylephrine plus tropicamide used together, and we'll do that a lot for like our neonatal eye exams that our um, ophthalmologist does at, at Nemours, for instance. But phenylephrine is the main one in this category that will help to dilate the eye. Again, photosensitivity, conjunctival hyperemia, those are common things you'll see with uh, this drug here. And then kind of the last one here we'll talk about in terms of doing your eye exams. If you're looking for like corneal abrasions or foreign bodies and things like that, this is where um, a fluorescein can come into play. And basically it's a dye that reacts under um, blacklight or woods lamp. 
And so basically it's going to be able to be taken up into things like these corneal abrasions. So that way you can have a better uh, ability to visualize them because you wouldn't be able to see this just with the naked eye. So you can go ahead and um, go ahead and give the patient anesthetic like tetracaine. Put in the fluorescine. It usually comes like a little stick that has a drug um, uh, impregnated on it. And then place that into the um, uh, into the conjunctiva. Uh, and then that will then be a, wash it over the eye itself. And then you'll find that you can use your woods lamp and get a good view of the any kind of abrasions or anything that are there. So, um, you know, it can cause some hypersensitivity and stinging, but typically you're using an anesthetic beforehand. So hopefully that'll be mitigated. All right, and that's it for this section. Hopefully you guys don't mind if I finished early, but you know, that's what it is. Um, let's see if you have any questions. We got one question up on the board here. Someone says, regarding the H1 receptor antagonist, do the first generation drugs work CNS uh, and peripherally, while the second generation only works peripherally? That is correct. The first generation drugs are able to cross the blood brain barrier and work centrally along with the peripheral effects. So for instance, if I had someone who's having allergies and maybe they're having, um, you know, just peripheral issues of, you know, allergies and then they need to stay awake, they need to drive a car, go to work or something like that, second generations are going to be preferred there, right? If I had someone who was, say for instance, I have like a kid who got exposed to something that's causing dermatitis and they were scratching a bunch when they went to sleep and that was causing them to, to leave a bunch of abrasions and things like that in their legs, causing bleeding and whatnot. You know, you want to prevent secondary infections. Using an antihistamine that's a first generation might be actually really beneficial for that type of patient because it will relieve the itching they're experiencing peripherally, but also make them sleepy. That way they're less likely to wake up and start scratching, right? Um, so little things like that you want to consider when trying to choose uh, the right one for your patient there. But if a kid was like going to school, having seasonal allergies, I wouldn't want to use a first generation drug because they'll just knock them out, okay? Or if you're using it for antimatic purposes, uh, second generation drugs aren't going to cut it because they don't do anything up in the brain. Well, the first generations that do that, right? So be able to delineate based off of um, what effects you're looking for and you know what drugs are going to be able to, to satisfy that, okay? What other questions do you all have for the exam? Anything at all? Otherwise, uh, if you don't, um, feel free to email me. You know, obviously the earlier in the week you can email me, the better. Um, but this is the end of the material for this test. So we'll still meet Tuesday to start new material, but that won't be on the test for Wednesday. Okay, so just FYI. You guys have any other questions? All right, Savannah's asking, sorry, going back to derm, can you explain the hydrating properties of cream versus lotion and such? Yeah, so um, with that one, you can see that basically things that um, stick around for longer or things that are more occlusive tend to have a more hydrating sort of effect, right? Um, so for instance, if you have someone who has kind of like a sc uh, dry, scaly sort of um, dermatitis or something going on, if you apply uh, something like a ointment, that's gonna be able to stick around for longer there on top of the skin. It also kind of traps in any moisture and will help to uh, provide sort of a nice emollient sort of effect and will help to hydrate it and soften up that skin there, right? Versus something if a patient had, um, you know, kind of a weeping kind of lesion, really crusty and, um, you know, producing fluid, that's where something a little more drying might be more effective there. Um, you know, so that's why that caveat, which again, I, I know people who work in derm, they hate this because um, it kind of oversimplifies things, but they say in derm, if it's wet, dry it, if it's dry, wet it. Um, so that's why that may lead you to choosing something like an ointment versus something like a cream or a lotion, for instance. So that's the general rule of thumb of it. Um, again, if you talk to someone who works in derm, they might tell you something a little different, but it's very um, uh, use case specific. Even if that does not answer your question though. That's the only answers I like to give are perfect ones. Fortunately, I'm not very good at it, so I'm trying to increase my percentage there. What other questions? And again, there are no dumb questions, but most of you probably have not really been hitting the book so hard on this topic here. You probably got other tests going on, or you got a week before your, your test, so I understand if you don't have anything prepared, but certainly 
you have questions in the meantime, um, email me. I'll be happy to get back to you. And yeah, that'll be pretty much it. So um, you're all free to go for the week now. I'll get that um, feedback to you guys on your prescription assignments. You'll have two weeks from today to do the next one. So hopefully that's enough time for you all to um, uh, be able to get that done. It not be too, too rough. Uh, so for contact dermatitis, you would use a lotion more for prevention of dry patches and a cream ointment for outbreak areas. Um, not necessarily. I think um, frequently also want to think about like what your dosage forms you have available are. So you may not have uh, you know a cream and a lotion and an ointment of the same drug all available together. You might have to choose between the hydrocortisone ointment or hydro hydrocortisone cream. Um, you know, two, it's one of those things where it's like, how much of a difference is it going to make? How really dry is it or versus how wet is it? Um, you know, could both of them do the same job? You know, could a cream and or an ointment do the same work? Probably. Cause again, you're more maybe getting benefit from the steroid component of it than anything else potentially. Right. Um, so again, I'm probably not, you know, for like test question purposes, I'm not going to have you say, okay, well, you want to use hydrocortisone. Which one of these dosage forms will be best for this patient case? I don't think I want to get into that. Like, I would rather, you know, things like, okay, well, if, I know if it's alcohol-based, it's going to be much more drying because that tends to evaporate much more quickly. And just in general, know that things like, you know, things with higher uh, oil-based content, like ointments, tend to have more occlusiveness. They stick around for longer, right? Which means more contact time for the drug with the skin, those are the kind of things I'm going to focus on. Certainly in your medicine courses when you hit derm, they may be more specific on that sort of thing there, but um, I don't think I'm going to get that granular in terms of um, asking you to use a lotion, a cream, or an ointment for this particular question. That would be kind of, I don't know, too, too, too persnickety, I guess. I'm not, probably not the right word, but. Any other questions I can answer for you? Uh, if not, thanks for joining me. I appreciate it. And I will um, see you guys next week. You can feel free to email me. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording here. All right. Well, thanks for uh, joining me. I'll see you guys next week. Have a great day and a great rest of your